<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today's online training class. Uh, my name is Yuan Minghua. I'm a senior application scientist at Bluecl. So today we're going to talk about uh, AFM uh, atomic resolution imaging. And this technique, the FM atomic resolution imaging, is a very hands-on um, uh, technique. So I will cover those uh, major operations in today's session. But uh, more importantly is uh, uh, the hands-on practice. So if you later on you want to practice this technique, and I hope uh, uh, this, uh, the operations I covered in today's session will be helpful. So uh, first, let's take a look at the outline of the session. So I will first uh, show some uh, images and see what is uh, called atomic resolution uh, imaging. And also then we will talk about uh, what is the conditions we need to meet in order to achieve uh, atomic resolution imaging. And then uh, we're going to use some examples uh, talk, to talk in more detail and how to achieve uh, the atomic resolution. And uh, the sample I'm going to use is one is uh, mica uh, lattice imaging uh, in air with contact mode, and the second one is uh, images uh, HOPG in air with STM mode to see the lattice. And the last one is uh, we want to image the uh, talk about imaging the calcite in fluid with tube tapping to see the lattice. And I will mainly focus on the example for the mica and calcite. I just briefly uh, go over the HOPG. So first, let's take a look at some uh, examples. Uh, the first image example here is the uh, HOPG, right? And uh, I think a lot of you already image, and probably this is one of the first samples you image when you learn FM. And you can see these uh, uh, very nice atomic uh, steps, uh, probably like uh, a few angstroms each step, right? This can size is two microns, so it's not small. And do we call this uh, atomic resolution imaging? And of course it's not, right? Because for the atomic resolution, uh, we want to um, see the features uh, in the X, Y, the atomic features, atomic scale features in the X, Y, right? So this one doesn't qualify for the atomic resolution, right? And let's take a look at the next one, right? This is a mica image that in uh, contact mode. And um, we can see those uh, lattice of the mica. Those are probably the spacing is about like five angstroms, um, and uh, I think this qualifies uh, the atomic re resolution, right? And I think some people believe like uh, for the contact mode, even in mica lattice, actually we are using um, like a lot of uh, uh, atoms on the tip to image uh, a lot of uh, lattice on the on the mica surface uh, at the same time, so. Uh, this is probably why we cannot, uh, typically we cannot see atomic defects uh, using this technique. But this is a nice image and we can see uh, atomic resolution. And some of you maybe notice there are some like uh, drift here and we will talk about a little bit more on, on when we go to detail. So next example is HOPG. And for example, uh, I use uh, the STM and um, you can see those are lattice, right? And uh, in the STM, we actually use a single atom, right, to image individual lattice. This is a true atomic resolution, right? And this is a very nice atomic resolution imaging. And the last one is calcite. So this calcite are imaged in fluid with people's tapping mode. Right? You can see those lattice. The lattice is about like a 5 angstrom or 7.5 uh, uh spacing, uh, depends on which direction. And the major difference, the big difference between this example uh, compared to the previous two uh, examples is uh, we can also see the steps, right? We can see a single atomic step of the calcite in a fluid, as well as the lattice, the atomic scale lattice on each surface. And we sometimes we call this uh, true atomic resolution because we actually in the image those lattice one by one. Okay, uh, next let's talk about uh, what's the requirement we need to meet in order to achieve atom atomic resolution. Right? The first one is the FM system. We need to have a good FM system. 
right? For example, for the multi mode, right? We, it's a pretty good system, and uh, typically I use the uh, E-Scanner or A-Scanner. It's capable of the photonic resolution. And uh, one thing for this uh, E-Scanner, A-Scanner, is it has a very, very low uh, XY noise, because we are looking at the feature in XY, right? And other systems like uh, Fast Scan and Icon are also capable, and also uh, the um, the Innova scanner, uh, Innova system is capable of the, the atomic resolution. The XY scanner noise is good enough for atomic resolution. And also we need to have a good Z uh, system noise. So for all those systems I mentioned above, uh, like um, uh, if it's in a good environment and uh, they are all capable of this, uh, the system noise can all meet the atomic resolution requirement. And next is the FM probe. That's an important, uh, uh, important factor here, right? We need to use a sharp probe, right? And because we are imaging the atomic lattice. This sharp probe is not that critical for the contact mode probably, but it's very critical for the pixel stepping mode because we want to e uh, image those lattice uh, one by one, not like a, a lot of them together. And also for the probe side, like uh, the small and the soft cantilever is important. We will talk a little more detail about this later. So the small cantilever has uh, like a be uh, better defense sensitivity. It's more sensitive, and soft cantilever we can control the force better. Another uh, important uh, aspect for the atomic resolution imaging is uh, uh, drift control. So we are we're gonna scan like a very small size, like a 10, uh, 15 nanometer, and any small amount of the drift uh, in XY will be very obvious in the image. Sometimes the drift is too much, we cannot even see the lattice. And sometimes uh, to overcome uh, this drift, we need to stabilize the system. And the other way we can overcome this drift, we can scan faster. So we spend less time on each image, so there will be less drift within one image. And uh, of course, we need to use a uh, uh, fresh new sample, clean sample, and we need to control the contamination. Right, and then for the uh, fluid imaging, like people typing in fluid, uh, the very important thing is we need to use a very clean solution. And of course, this uh, atomic resolution imaging uh, it needs a lot of hands-on practice. Uh, and also, uh, even you uh, already know how to do the atomic resolution imaging, and uh, sometimes you cannot uh, just go there and engage tip to get the image. It needs uh, some uh, prepare, preparation and uh, some time to get a time resolution. So uh, sometimes you need to be patient. Okay, then let's go to uh, examples and talk a little bit more detail about uh, how to achieve a uh, time resolution imaging uh, for each example. So the first one I want to talk about is images uh, mica lattice in contact mode. And uh, this is a ima uh, the, the example I already showed you. And um, for uh, image this uh, uh, sample, the system I used is a multi-mode with the e-scanner. And the probe I used is SNLC. And I briefly mentioned that we want to use uh, a small and uh, a soft cantilever. So the SNLC is uh, typically my uh, uh, choice for this contact mode atomic, atomic resolution imaging on the lattice, on the mica. And the scan size is uh, 10 nanometer, so it's roughly like uh, uh, 20 uh, lattice in uh, in the scan range in the one line, right? And we scan at uh, 60 hertz, and to overcome the drift. And you may notice like there's a little bit drift uh, still, right? Even at uh, 60 hertz. But uh, for this image, I didn't warm up the system enough, so you still can see that. And uh, we use very low PI gain, uh, like uh, use point two, like uh, basically just to uh, let the tip to chop, uh, track the, the surface slope, right, and all the drift. And we scan at a 90 degree and look at the friction signal. We found that the friction signal is uh, uh, has better contrast for this uh, contact mode imaging. And typically, I use diffraction sampling, roughly about like a point two volts above the uh, free air diffraction. And I also use the rounding 0.4 to get rid of the uh, artifacts on the edge. And uh, if I scan like a resolution at the 512 by 512 and at the 60 hertz, I uh, like uh, this whole image takes about uh, less than 10 seconds. Okay, then uh, next I will talk about the detail uh, step by step uh, for each of these. 
So first, we need to, uh, choose the system, right? We talk about the ICON, FastScan, Innova, and the multimodal here are all capable of autonomous resolution imaging. And for the multimodal, we need to choose the E scanner or the A scanner. The J scanner is not capable. The J scanner is a good scanner, but it's not designed for this application. And once we have the, choose the system, and uh, we need to set up correctly to have a low noise, right? And uh, for the multi-mode, uh, my favorite is the, use the tripod, uh, the bungee cord with the big uh, concrete plate, right? And uh, here it shows my setup, right? And actually, you can, uh, this is a setup is uh, in our, uh, like, uh, office uh, area. It's not very bright, and it's on the second floor. And even with this, uh, like, uh, not very good environment, with this server, I can get a summer resolution on the second floor with no problem. And one small trick here is when I mount the, uh, the head of the multi-mode, typically I, I put an image here, I typically I coil the, the cable a little bit so it doesn't protrude. Because so later on, I'm going to put it on the, the foam enclosure, and uh, I don't want the, the cable to touch inside the wall or the foam, foam enclosure. Otherwise, uh, the, the noise, the vibration from the environment uh, could be like a transfer to the, the NFM directly from the, uh, through the cable. And if I use the multi-mode and uh, the foam enclosure is uh, definitely required because it isolates the acoustic, no acoustic noise. So acoustic noise in the environment is very, uh, very critical, right? It's, uh, it's a noise for the, uh, very critical for this uh, atomic resolution imaging. It will show up in the image if it's not isolated properly. And if you have a good environment, uh, relative quiet and a solid floor, and uh, if you use the multi-mode, the air table, uh, typically is sufficient also. Just like uh, I'm uh, in a, like a relative noise environment, I prefer the tripod. And for the icon fast scan, the AVH1000 encoder comes with the system, typically it is good enough if the, the lab environment is uh, 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 relative quiet. And for the Innova with the air table, and also the Innova, the uh, acoustic uh, color, uh, it's uh, sufficient uh, to get the atomic, atomic resolution uh, imaging. And here I show, uh, once I set up this uh, uh, multi-mode on the tripod, I do an imaging and to put on the enclosure. Right, next we need to use the fresh sample. Like for the, the mica sample, typically what we do is we use a stick tape to stick on the surface of the mica sample and peel it off. And typically, the whole layer of the mica will come off with the thick tape, right? But sometimes, what happens is uh, the, it could be like just a partially of the, the layer, top layer came off. And uh, in that case, uh, we need to use the thick tape to peel off again, right? And try a few times until I get the whole layer of the, the mica came off. Like if I have this partially peeled off the, the mica surface, then the arm pure, the area will be contaminated by stick tape. And when we uh, land the probe, we don't know, right? It's, uh, there's no feature on the, the mica. We don't know if it's uh, like uh, in the clean area or the contaminated area. And if it's in the contaminated area, the tip will be contaminated immediately and we cannot get the atomic resolution uh, image. So that's why uh, I, if this happens, I will peel off a few more times until I get a good layer of the peel off. So then we can mount a uh, cantilever in the holder, right? And we need to use a new fresh probe. And I mentioned I use the SNLC, but you can also use SNLA and uh, the, even the Scanesis Air probe. They are all capable of uh, this uh, autonomous imaging, and they're pretty sharp. And all these probes I mentioned, they have a nitride lever, right? And the nitride lever, I found, like, it tends to have a, a static charge on the surface, on the cantilever. And uh, if there's a static charge on the cantilever, when we try to engage the tip on the surface, what happens is um, this long-range static force will keep bending the cantilever, right? When the cantilever gets closer, then the, uh, the, strong, the, the static force gets stronger and more bending in the cantilever. And you will see that like, the cantilever uh, deflection signal will keep changing. And it will make the engage very difficult. And if it's engaged, uh, the... Um, and the static charge may like dissipate, and it will cause uh, the force 
loaded on the probe actually is much more, much higher than what we expected, right? And this will damage the, uh, the sharp tip of the sample. And uh, if the force is too strong, and we cannot get the atomic resolution like the lattice on the image. And uh, so we need to remove the, this uh, static charge on the cantilever. And a good way to do this is um, once you mount the cantilever, and you can hold the, the holder and use a anti-static gun and uh, point to at this cantilever and uh, squeeze the trigger a few times. And I found that this can uh, very effectively uh, remove the static charge. And this anti-static gun is pretty inexpensive, and you can find it from uh, on Amazon, and it costs probably less than $100. And it's pretty effective uh, a little tool for this application. And if the sample also has the static charge, you can use this anti-static gun to uh, discharge it also. So then let's, uh, next we need to uh, engage on the uh, sample surface. So typically uh, we, uh, what I said is uh, I uh, set the deflection set point, probably like a roughly a 0.2 volts above the, the, um, the free deflection, then click to engage. And once it's engaged, then um, I typically what I do is I will actually uh, decrease, uh, uh, increase the deflection set point by 0.1 volts. So this way I want to check if the if the the tip is actually engaged on the surface, and uh, if uh, the tip is actually engaged on the surface, when I increase the 0.1 volts of the deflection, then uh, the C piezo should not change much, right? Because it's on the surface, and if it's not on the surface, then the Z piezo will like move down quite a bit, right? And once I confirm the tip is on the surface. And typically what I do is I start to decrease the set point, right? I keep it slowly uh, decrease the uh, deflection set point, and at some point the, the tip will, the, will start to retract from surface, right? Because it's below uh, the free uh, air deflection, right? Once I see the Z piezo is uh, uh, withdrawn, retract from surface, then I increase the deflection set point slightly, like a point 1, point 0.2 volts, right? And then this way I can make sure the loading force uh, on the tip is uh, very small, and the tip is just landed on the tip, uh, landed on the sample with a very small force. Right? This way, we can control the force. And sometimes during the scanning, if you see the image here like this, right? There's a lot, a lot of the scratch lines. The, you can see the lattice, but it's not very well defined. There's a lot of noise. Uh, or even like uh, if you like a uh, scan uh, during the, the image, the half image looks pretty good, and suddenly the the it goes bad. You cannot see the lattice anymore. And typically, this indicates uh, the the force the landed by the tip on the sample is pretty high, uh, too 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 high, right? And it's scratching the surface, or the tip uh, just crashed like in this sample. And then we need to uh, adjust the defecting uh, set point. And we can go in through the same way. And typically what we can do is we start to reduce the defense set point. And at some point, the, the piezo, the piezo will retract because it's a loose tracking on the surface. Then I go back, reduce the defense set point by like a point 0.1, point 0.2 volts. Just let the tip uh, land on the sample, right, with very uh, small force. And if we see, like uh, in, if this, uh, case happens like it's scratching on surface or the the tip is crashed in some place. Then typically I will like offset x y to a new location to scan. So this is how we can control the force uh, small right to low force to uh, prevent the tip crash and uh, keep it sharp. And for the contact motor imaging, um, I found like uh, the deflection uh, the the friction signal is. Uh, um, has a much better uh, contrast for this application, right? So in the contact mode, typically we scan very fast, like I mentioned, like a 60 hertz, that's very fast. And if we scan 10, 10 nanometer, there will be like uh, 20 lattice in one scan line, and back force is like uh, 40 lattice. If we scan at uh, 60 hertz, that's about like a 2,400 lattice we need to track uh, within one second. And this is very difficult for the Z scanner to check, right? For the Z scanner to check this 2,400 lattice, 
within one second of hand down. And if we want to check, we will need to use a very high gain. And the high gain is not good because the high gain will introduce a noise, and this is not good for the autonomous resolution imaging. So instead of using high gain to check the topography, we use a very low gain, like for example, we here use like a 0.2, to just let the, the tip to check the sample uh, tilt, sample slope, and also the, the, the thermal drift in the Z. So let's keep it a relative uh, constant force, right? Because we are imaging very small area, like a 10 nanometer, 15 nanometer, and in that area is uh, atomically like a uh, flat. So with this two, uh, point two gain, uh, it, it's sufficient for the tip to keep at a, a, a relative constant uh, total force. So since we are not tracking the lattice individually, so each individual lattice will cause diffraction error, right? Here, like I see, we are tracking the overall slope of the surface. We see the, the in the height. We see we don't see the the, the lattice uh, feature, right? But uh, in the diffraction arrow, we can see kind of those lattice uh, uh, features here. And what we found is if we scan at a 90 degree, the friction signal actually is uh, even uh, better contrast. And this is the trace and the retrace of the the friction signal, and we are scanning at a 90 degree. And we can clearly see those uh, lattice, individual lattice. And it has much better contrast compared to the diffraction error. And since the uh, friction signal, it depends on the scan direction, right? This is the trace and the retrace. You can see the contrast is um, uh, reversed. But the contrast is much better than the diffraction error with, uh, in, the, in the friction signal. And the key point here is typically we use the low gain just to check the, the sample slope. Right, and the drift in the Z, and use a scan at a 90 degree and look at the friction signal to uh, see those uh, atomic lattice in the contact mode. And sometimes if we scan like uh, at 60 hertz, it's very fast, and uh, we will see some artifacts at the edge of the image. Like for example, uh, this image I scan at a 30, mic uh, 30 uh, nanometer, right, at a 60 hertz, then I will see uh, the artifacts, the, this black line, that's the artifacts from the scanning, right? What happens is if we scan at 60 hertz, right? And when it's reaching the end of the line in the image, then the tip needs to, uh, uh, return suddenly, right? And this is a mechanical abruption, right? They cause the uh, artifacts in the scan image. And in order to, uh, remove these artifacts, what we can do is we can apply uh, some of the rounding, rounding setting. Like for example, I set the rounding here to 0.2, right? And then the artifact is gone. Now you can find this rounding setting, like uh, in this uh, calibrate. If you go to nanoscope software, go to calibrate, scan X, Y, and you can find this rounding setting and set to 0.2. And what it does, what does this 0.2 mean is, uh, Instead of the scan this 30 micron, uh, 30 uh, nanometer, it will scan 20% more, like 36 uh, nanometers. And uh, the three nanometers on each side will use as a buffer uh, region, buffer area, to let the tip to turn around. And uh, during the data capturing, we only capture the 30 uh, nanometer area also. And this helps us to get rid of the, the artifacts on the edge. And you can see, uh, uh, compare these two images. Yeah, same area, same scan size, uh, 30, mic uh, 30 nanometer. The only difference is uh, for this one on the left, uh, I didn't apply any rounding. And for the right one, apply like a 0.2 rounding. And uh, there's no uh, edge effect, edge artifacts, right? So we already talked about um, we need to control the drift. Uh, one thing is we warm up the, the system, right? And the other way will scan faster, right? And um, to control the drift, one thing I want to mention is uh, do not use the double side tape to mount the uh, sample, right? We know that, we don't know that the double side tape tend to have a lot of drift. So if you mount the sample, use like the super glue or like a, even epoxy to mount, mount it firmly. Do not use double side tape. And here I want to show you some effect of the drift. And in order to make it more obvious, actually, uh, I didn't warm up the system enough, right? And I have two images to compare here. 
right? So for this one, right, I scan at a 10 hertz, right? I can see a lot of drift in the image, right? And there's overall drift, and also there's like a zigzag drift also. And with this drift at this scan rate, 10 hertz, I, I can kind of see all the lattice, but I cannot see the individual lattice very well, right? We can, we cannot see the atomic resolution here, right? And for the same, same uh, sample, right, if I scan at 60 hertz, then the image is much better, right? Because we spend much less time in one image. The drift rate, drift speed of, uh, is the same, is, right? But if we spend less time on an image, then there will be less drift, right? So that's why the 60 hertz uh, scanner image looks much better. You can see those individual lattice in this case. Right? So to control the drift, right? I want to mention again, warm up the system if needed, right? And also uh, scan faster to reduce the effect of the drift in the image. So once we have the, the nice image of the lattice, and some of you may ask, uh, how do I know this is uh, the, the real image of the real lattice instead of the noise, right? To uh, confirm this, uh, we can uh, do some check, right? Well, what I do is we can change the scan size or the scan rate and to check how the feature changes. So if the feature is a real, uh, real lattice, then if we uh, change the scan size, the size of the lattice will not change. The absolute uh, the size of the lattice will not change, right? Then if we, like, if we double the scan size, right, then there will be a double amount of the lattice in the image. Like, for example, this is a 10 micron image of the lattice. Then if I scan at uh, 20 micron, then I have, like, uh, twice as many as the lattice compared to the first image. That confirms that the features are real. But for the noise, if it's, this pattern is from the noise, typically the noise has a, a fixed frequency, right? And if we, uh, if I scan size, if my scan size is doubled, the frequency of the noise will not double, right? And it will have the same amount of noise. So the absolute size of the noise pattern will be doubled if I double the scan size. And same thing for the scan speed, right? If it's, these are the real uh, lattice, then if I increase the speed, they still the same, right? They still the same size. But if I uh, increase the speed, uh, we'll, I will sp uh, spend less time on the image. And uh, since the frequency of the noise is fixed, then the noise pattern will look like uh, uh, doubled. So by this mean, we can tell if the, the lattice image is uh, actually real or it's just a noise. So the above example, I go through, uh, I, I uh, use the, the, our multi mode with the e-scan, but you can use this, uh, you can do the same thing on the uh, fast scan and icon with no problem, and also in Nova. And there's some key points if we use this, um, uh, practice this on the icon and the fast scan. So icon fast scan is typically default set to the XY closed loop on. It will use the closed loop sensor to uh, make the linear movement. And uh, the closed loop sensor is pretty good. XY sensor is pretty good on icon and fast scan, but it's not good enough uh, for this atomic resolution imaging. So if you want to use the icon and fast scan for atomic resolution imaging, then definitely you need to turn the closed loop off. Use the open loop. And in the open loop, uh, actually uh, the piezo linearity at that small scan uh, size, scan range is pretty good, like a 10 nanometer, 15 nanometer. So the, even in open loop, it's pretty linear. So you don't want to, uh, you don't need to worry about the linearity in open loop for this uh, atomic, atomic resolution imaging. And for Innova, uh, it's capable of this atomic resolution imaging. And one key point here I want to point out is there's this setting called a small scan uh, setting, right? Even if you have a large scan, large area scanner, you can use this setting. And what it does is, uh, if it's, uh, the scanner is set to the small scan size, and it will use the low voltage to drive the, the XY scanner. And effectively, it will have a, a smaller uh, scan range and have uh, less noise in XY. And if it's set to the normal scan size uh, scan area, then what it does, it, it will generate the low voltage uh, drive signal also for XY. But before it goes to the scanner, it will be amplified by a high voltage bulb, 
right? Like a, with a scale, like a factor of uh, roughly about a 10. So then it will generate a high voltage uh, uh, drive signal for the scanner and uh, to have the large scan area. So this uh, amplification of the voltage not only amplifies uh, the scan area, it also amplifies uh, the electrical noise from the low voltage drive signal. And uh, that means uh, more noise in XY, right? So with the same uh, large area scanner, you can set to the small scan uh, size uh, in the Innova. And that is a, a better uh, choice for the atomic resolution because it has less noise in the XY. So here I summarize uh, the, the procedure for the atomic resolution imaging in content mode for those of the latex. And uh, here's the procedure I wrote. So first I set up the tip and sample uh, distance in the air and the laser alignment roughly, right? Then we can uh, prepare the sample. I peel off the mica surface to get a fresh uh, clean surface and then mount the sample on the, on the FM. Then I mount a fresh probe to the uh, candidate holder and I want to use uh, uh, the anti-static gun to discharge the, the, the char static charger on the cantilever so we can have a good engage and control the force better, right? Then we mount the probe on the uh, probe holder in the cantilever and align the laser and the PSPD. And if you already warm up the system at this step, and you want to do this uh, as quick as possible to minimize the operation outside of the enclosure. So this will minimize the drift introduced by this operation, right? So it will, the system will stabilize very quickly once you put the, the sample, the cantilever on and engage, right? And then we, uh, once we um, um, align the, the can, uh, laser, then we put the, the uh, enclosure on the, um, on the motor mode, right? or the closer enclosure for the icon or the like uh, uh, Innova system, then um, we can start to set up the engage and the scanning parameter and the engage on the surface. So once the tip is engaged on the surface, right, typically what I do is uh, I do this routine, right? Decrease uh, the defection set point to let the, the tip retract from the surface, then uh, I uh, increase uh, like by 0.1.2 volts of diffraction of 0.3 volts to, uh, to let the tip just engage on the surface with a very small force. So this way we can control the force loading. And then we can uh, adjust the scan size, scan speed, scan angle to optimize the image. We want to scan fast to overcome the, the drift. And we scan in 90 degree, right? And use low gain and look at the freaking signal to have a better contrast of the lattice image. And uh, sometimes you need to monitor the imaging all the time. And if you see some like the tip is start to scratch the surface or it crash, then that means uh, the force is too high. And we need to adjust uh, the defection set point. And you can go through the routine again, reduce the set point, right, to check uh, to the point that the tip starts to retract from the surface, then uh, increase the set point a little bit to just let it engage on the surface and start scan. And here I have uh, some questions we can review, right? We talk about the, the procedure, and uh, here are some questions. And uh, one, the first question is uh, how we can reduce the thermal drift in an image, right? There are two uh, important aspects, right? We need to warm up the system so the drift uh, speed is lower. And if there's still drift, we can scan faster to reduce the effect of the drift in the image. The second question is, like, if the vertical diffraction keeps changing during it to be engaged, what do you think is the problem, right? And uh, if we use those natural probe, like, very likely there's a second charge on the surface. That's a problem. And uh, if there's this problem, what will it cause? It will be very difficult to engage. And if engaged, uh, the force may be very high, and it will cause the tip crash, right, the sharp tip to crash. And uh, with this, we cannot uh, get atomic resolution imaging. And to fix this, one way we can do is we use the anti-static gun to discharge this uh, static charge on the cantilever before we put it in the FM to engage. So next question is uh, why we use low feedback gain in the content mode, right? So we use like a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0.5. So the low feedback gain, the point here is uh, we want to use low feedback gain, gain just to check the sample uh, tilt or sample uh, slope, right? And uh, we want to use uh, 
uh, deflection or the friction signal to see the uh, atomic lattice. So next one question, so it's already answered, right? What data channel is the best? The friction signal. We stand at 90 degree and look at the friction signal. And what type of probe we prefer, right? Like the small cantilever and a soft probe. We briefly talk about this. I will talk a little bit more in the um, cosi uh, example. Okay, uh, next example is uh, HOPG with STM. So I will briefly talk about this. Um, so for this image, I image it with uh, uh, multi-mode again, so, but I use the A scanner. A scanner has a much smaller scan range, and it's designed for this kind of atomic resolution imaging. So you can see a very well-defined lattice image uh, with STM. And the probe I used is just a platinum iridium uh, wire and cut with a scissor. Right? Scan size is like uh, 5 nanometer, like uh, similar, like uh, for the contact mode, I use a very high scan rate, like a 40, 40 hertz, and I use that to look at the current instead of the height. And I use a very low uh, feedback gain to just check the surface uh, slope and the drift. And one thing for this uh, STM image on the HOB is I typically use a relatively low uh, sample bias, like a 50 millivolts, right, because the HOB is a pretty conductive. And also I use a little bit high, like a current set point, like a 2 nanoamp, relatively high, right? Before it's probably you use like a 0.5 or 1 nanoamp. So here I use 2 nanoamp. What it does is with this low sample bias and a little bit high uh, current set point, so the tip will be very close to the sample surface. And while, while it's scanning on, on, the, on the surface, those uh, lattice, right, it's, uh, the topography will be small, right, change up and down a little bit. And that small change in the topography will change the distance between tip and sample and cause enough uh, current change. That's why we can have a very good contrast in the current, right? For example, the range here is uh, 1.5 to 2.5 of the current range, even though I set to like a 2 nanoamp. So it has a plus or minus 0.5 uh, current change. It depends on the, the atom is lower or higher, right? It gives a very good contrast. So actually, uh, this is, so this is done in air, but actually you can get this similar result with, uh, in the fluid also. And that's called like uh, uh, EC uh, STM, right? The key, point, uh, key part of that is how well, we can code the, the STM tip. Make sure that only the very end of the tip is exposed to into the solution. Right? And that is a very hands-on, uh, needs a lot of practice, so we won't be able to cover that part in here. So next, the last one we want to talk about is uh, imaging the call sign uh, in the fluid with people's tapping mode. Right? I showed this example already. Right? We can see the that is on each surface, and we can see a single atomic uh, step here also. And this we call like a true atomic uh, resolution. And if there's any uh, defect in the lattice, then we can use this uh, technique to see those uh, defects also. And again, uh, to image this, I use the multi mode uh, with the E scanner. That's my favorite. And the probe I use is the fast scan C. And I will talk a little bit more about the, the probe. This is important here also. And scan size I use is 15 nanometer, right? And the scan rate is 4 hertz. So the peak force amplitude uh, for this imaging, I use, uh, typically I will use very small, like a 20 nanometer. Sometimes I even go lower, like a 10 nanometer or 5 nanometer. And we need to um, engage, uh, adjust engage set point. Typically I use uh, as low as possible. Like here I use 0 0.04, like a 40 millivolts engage set point. And, um, Tip force set point is 0.2. So this way we can um, preserve tip so make sure it doesn't crash during engage or during scanning. And the feedback gain is normal. I didn't apply any rounding. And the resolution is 256 by 256. And here you can see this the high channel. You can see the step and this lattice. This is the actual topography of the sample. Okay. So, so for this example, um, I will not go to the detail, we won't have the time to go to detail about how to operate the people's tapping or how to set up the fluid, but I will mainly focus on how to achieve the auto atomic resolution here. So the first thing I want to talk about is the cantilever, and it's important for this uh, technique. So in the ASM, now we all use uh, this optical lever to measure the cantilever bending or cantilever oscillation. 
And there's one parameter we call the diffraction sensitivity, and we use this to ca uh, characterize how sensitive is the cantilever to the bending, right? For example, if I bend the cantilever, this cantilever upward, right, in the z direction by like a 10 nanometer, and if it generates like uh, one volt of the signal from photo detector, then that means the diffraction sensitivity is 10 nanometer per volt. And the smaller this number means the diffraction sensitivity is better, it's more sensitive, right? And one uh, determining factor of this cantilever diffraction sensitivity is the length of the cantilever. And a short cantilever has a better uh, diffraction sensitivity, right? For example, if we have a two, uh, two cantilevers, one is a longer one, one is a shorter one, and we can, like, uh, probably bend the same amount, like a 10 nanometer in this direction for both cantilever, right? And the shorter cantilever will have uh, more uh, angular movement because it's shorter with this 10 nanometer. And the laser uh, position chain, laser spot position chain on a photo detector is proportional to this angular movement. And uh, let's say we get like one volt of the photo detector signal for this short cantilever, right? And it has defense density of 10 nanometers per volt. And uh, for the longer cantilever, we push up like a bandaid uh, by 10 nanometer also, right? Same amount. And uh, since it's longer, the angular change of the cantilever end is less, right? And it will, the laser spot on the photo detector will move less. And it will generate less uh, voltage signal from the photo detector, right? And uh, let's say we have like a 0.5 volts. Then if we move up a 10 nanometer, get a 0.5 volts of the uh, photo detector signal, that means uh, the diffraction sensitivity is 20 nanometer per volt. So that's uh, like a half of the, uh, it's less sensitive, right, compared to the short one, right? So this different sensitivity is roughly proportional, inverse proportional to the length of the cantilever. And we also know that uh, um, the cantilever, so for the cantilever with a high different sensitivity, that means we can measure smaller bending. That means we can control force better, right? And another factor to determine the force control is the spring constant, right? For the soft cantilever, it has a smaller spring constant. That means we can control the force better. So then the best combination, like uh, for the can for the cantilever, right, for this atomic resolution imaging, then it should be the short cantilever with the smaller spring constant. Short and a small uh, soft cantilever is the best for the atomic resolution imaging. Okay. I want to mention also, like uh, since we are talking about the three imaging, and this diffraction sensitivity is also uh, affected by the how clean is the fluid cell. Right? If there's a lot of dirt on the fluid cell window, the glass window, then the reflected laser will disperse. And the laser spot on the photo detector will be larger, right? And it will be less sensitive. Right? So the diffraction sensitivity is uh, also related to how clean is the fluid cell. So make sure uh, when we clean the fluid cell, make sure it's clean. And another uh, factor that uh, determines the diffraction sensitivity is the system. So even the same cantilever, Right? If we put it on a different uh, FM, it will have different, sensi different, sens different uh, different sensitivity because the optical path is different. So now we know uh, roughly uh, what kind of probe we're going to choose, right? So for the fluid imaging, uh, the SNM probe is uh, a um, very uh, common probe we use. And um, uh, in the SNM probe, SNL probe, right, we have like a four cantilevers on one probe, uh, one chip. So there are like uh, two uh, cantilevers on one side, right, um, with uh, like a thick, uh, thick uh, legs, right? One is bigger, one is smaller. And there's another two with the thinner legs on the other side, also like a one bigger, one uh, uh, smaller. Right, this is a picture of the uh, typical SNM probe. And they have like a spring, uh, different uh, spring constant, different lens. And um, the question is like uh, if you use this SNL probe, to, uh, for the atomic resolution imaging, which probe you will choose, right? And we already talked about the previous slide. Probably you already know the answer, right? The C probe is our choice because it's smaller, it's shorter, has better defense sensitivity, and it's softer, has better force control. And since we are talking about uh, the fluid imaging and uh, this kind of uh, small and uh, thinner leg cantilever has another advantage is it has a less hydrodynamic dampening effect. So it will cause a less uh, force background by the hydrodynam hydrodynamic dampening, and it's better uh, for the people's tapping mode. 
And besides the SNLC probe, right, we uh, have other probes uh, we typically recommend. One is uh, Scanesis, uh, Scanesis Fluid Plus. It's a sharp, very sharp probe, and it has an even smaller uh, cantilever. Like uh, for the SNLC, it's about like uh, 120 micron long, and for the Scanesis Fluid Plus, it's only 70 micron long, right, the length. And the other one, actually, is my favorite, is the Fast Scan C probe. It's even smaller, right? It's only 40 micron long, uh, the cantilever, and it's very sensitive. And even though it's uh, designed for the fast scan, you can use it on the multimodal with no problem or fast scan. Right? And uh, all these probes has a very relative uh, small spring constant, like SNLC here shows like uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, right? Scan is fluid plus is roughly 0 0.7, and the fast scan C is roughly 0 0.8. Okay. So we choose a, a, a good probe for this imaging. Then uh, the actual um, critical part for this autonomous resolution imaging in the fluid is the contamination control. Right? We need to make sure everything is clean. Right? We need to clean the tweezer, right? Because the tweezer will handle the probe. Right? If there's contamination, it will transfer to the, the probe and uh, later on transfer into fluid or to the sample. Right? So typically, I use like a half and a half of the ethanol and the IPA to wipe the, the tweezers. And also for the sample and the fluid, fluid cell, I need to clean them. I typically use a, like a baby brush and uh, use uh, the soap water to clean the surface, both the fluid cell and the sample, right? Some of you uh, never heard of it, like uh, you want to clean the fluid cell in the, in the, the liquid. You actually need to do this, right? You need to clean both sides, the back side and the, the front side, right? You need to make sure the the full cell is clean. And all sample, we need to use the, uh, the brush to brush it with the soap water. And then once we brush it, we use like a DI wall to rinse it. Okay. And we use uh, like the dry uh, night cream or compressed air to uh, dry it. And one thing here I want to point out, do not use those uh, the canned air for those computer cleaning to clean the sample. It will actually introduce much more uh, 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 contamination on the surface, right? And typically, I use uh, a clean container to transport uh, the parts once I, I clean them. So I can use a plastic uh, like a case like here. Once I clean them, I put it inside the, the plastic container, right? Then I can transport to the, the FM system to use them. So this way, it will not get contaminated by the air when I transfer, right? Probably I will walk like a pretty long distance from the sink to the, the FM system. So when we handle the uh, parts, like the cantilever or the, the fluid cell, uh, definitely uh, wear gloves when to control the contamination. And um, when you mount the cantilever, right, or handle the uh, fluid cell, uh, try not to breathe on the sample or the probe holder, right, or the, or the tip, right? This may introduce additional contamination. So, and uh, for the fluiding uh, imaging, the imaging media, like the fluid, typically water, right? We want to use uh, pure water, the analytical grade, like a pure water, as the imaging media, right? The regular DI water is not clean enough for this uh, atomic resolution, right? And uh, when you apply the water on the sample or on the uh, probe, uh, probe or the probe holder, Try to use those clean pipette, like those you use like for the bio lab, like a disposable clean pipette. Or if you have those clean the, um, glass pipette, that's even better. And I want to show uh, you some examples of uh, the contaminations, because the control contamination is really the, the key for the atomic resolution imaging in the fluid. And here I have two examples, right? I clean the top side sample the uh, same way, right? And first I use uh, the DI water as the uh, imaging fluid. So, and before I use it, actually I filter it with 0.2 micron filter, right? And then I image it. I can, and I can see there's a lot of contamination on the surface here, right? The contamination is not big, actually, right? If you look at the size, so this is a 40 micron, the size is about like a 10, probably 10 to like a 30 nanometers, uh, 40 nanometer, right? It's like a 10 to 30 nanometer. It's pretty small, but it, the 0.2 micron fil uh, filter definitely cannot filter out these contaminations. 
And once uh, we use this uh, uh, water, right, the contamination will deposit on the sample surface. Right? The problem here is not that uh, the sample surface is uh, covered by some of the part, some areas covered by contaminations. The bigger problem actually here is if we the tip, sharp tip scan over those contaminations, typically they're like a very soft uh, material, right? That it will contaminate the tip immediately, right? Then we no longer can get the uh, the clean image. We cannot get the atomic resolution image on the calcified animal. Right? Once it's uh, contaminated, it will be very difficult to clean the tip. Right? So instead of the DI water, so the second time I use the pure water, right? those, those analytical uh, pure water right? you can buy from Sigma Outreach. So then you can see the same scan size, you can see very clean surface will define the lattice of the calcified, right? And this is much clean. Right? And we need this kind of image for atomic resolution. So make sure you use the pure water as uh, the image media, not the DI water, even with the filter. So next, we need to set up the, the fluid cell. And uh, typically, I set up the fluid cell in air first to align the, uh, the laser and uh, to set up the tip sample distance. And um, actually, if you um, do this at the beginning, it's even better. So once you set up, right, you put it into the, the FM, into the enclosure to let it warm up, or like leave it into the enclosure to let it warm up, right? Then we can wash the fluid cell, wash the sample, and it, uh, so it allows the, t uh, the system to have enough time to warm up. And once I clean the cell calcite sample, and uh, before I put on the FM to image, actually, I first what I do is uh, I typically like I first add a few drops of the pure water on a calcite surface, right? Calcite is uh, slightly soluble in water, right? And uh, this a few drops of pure water will dissolve the, like a few layers on the calcite surface, and it will help to further clean the surface. And what it does is add a few drops, right, wait five minutes, and remove the water, then add another a few drops, and repeat this a few times. And at the end, I leave a, very, a small drop of the water on the calcite surface. I mentioned here okay, a small water drop. The reason is because I don't want the water to like overspill when put on the uh, fluid cell, right? Because if it overspills, it goes to the sample park, and then the contamination on the sample park might uh, maybe will like uh, migrate to the solution and eventually go to the sample surface and contaminate it. So we want to use a small amount of water on the calcite surface to make sure it doesn't spill. Right. Once we put the, the fluid cell in the airframe, right, now we can set up the, the parameters. Right. There's two parts of the parameter uh, is important here. Right. One is the engage set point. Right. For the people tapping uh, mode, we need to reduce the engage set point here, engage setting, in the engage setting. So typically I use like a 0 0.04, like for the front scan C. So the, the rule of thumb here is that we want to use the as small as possible for the engage set point to, um, without any force engage, right? Control the, the force during the engage. And also, typically, I uh, set the engage amplitude the same as the uh, scanning amplitude, right? If I want to scan at 20 nanometer, then I set the uh, P-force amplitude also 20 nanometer during the engage. This way, once the tip is engaged on surface, it doesn't have to change the amplitude. Otherwise, it will do another uh, optimization by the software. And we want to uh, reduce those uh, as much as possible. And for the scanning parameter here, right? So definitely we want to turn off the auto control, right? This is uh, not for beginner anymore. So this is advanced uh, image mode. We want to turn off the uh, the scanner's control. We want to control all the parameters by ourselves, right? And uh, for the pupil step point, we use uh, as low as possible. Because uh, typically we can use a little bit lower than the engage set point. The reason here is that in the during the engage we want to use slightly higher than the imaging set point. Is uh, when we the, the step motor move right the tip uh, the cantilever is like shake a little bit in the fluid. It can cause a little bit high uh, diffraction, right? If it's uh, set like too low, it will uh, cause a false uh, engage easily. That's why I use a slightly higher engage set point compared to the scanning. And we can uh, use like a regular uh, scan game, and all the auto control is off. 
and uh, we set at the engage uh, uh, the scanning peak force amplitude 20 nanometer that typically I use, and we can go even lower, like a 10 nanometer, 5 nanometer, and we can we want to use as high as possible for the peak force frequency, right? For the regular uh, multimodal setup, the maximum frequency we can use in the fluid is a 2 kilohertz, right? And we set at 2 kilohertz. And uh, I want to mention here is like uh, for the engage settings, this 20 nanometer engage uh, amplitude, uh, this is only available in the version 9. In the version A15 software, it's fixed at 100 nanometer, I believe. So if you want to use this, uh, it is available only in version 9 software. Okay. So once engage on the surface, all right, um, the software will do some optimization. And I will uh, very closely uh, monitor the force curve. I, I want to make sure uh, the software is uh, catching the correct single distance. So it's a feedback on the maximum force on the on the force curve. Right? For example, here is correct. Right? It's uh, the feedback on the maximum force about a point two, uh, point four here probably, point oh four volt. Right? And if in case the feedback uh, the software didn't catch the the correct single distance and the feedback on the maximum force. What you can do is uh, click the auto configure, so it will try to find the single distance again, so it can feed back correctly. And sometimes actually, I open up this parameter called a single distance new, right? This determines what when is the peak force. So I open up. You can use this like a show all parameter, and you can see this uh, parameter single distance new, right? And in case the software cannot uh, catch the correct single distance right away. And I just manually type in this value, the default value. So for two, for like a eight kilo, uh, two kilohertz, roughly like a eighty or seventy-five. And then I slightly adjust it to make sure it's the feedback on the uh, maximum force. The key point here is that we want to uh, make sure the force is low to reduce the the chance that it get a crash. Right. And for the four kilohertz, and uh, if you scan the two fifty-six, we can scan the four hertz. And that's pretty good, right? And um, once we confirm the the feedback is good, and uh, you can further adjust uh, the the settings. Like you can, if you want, you can go to even lower uh, amplitude, peak force tracking amplitude, or adjust the peak force uh, set point to get a better uh, image, better tracking. Right? So once we confirm the the tracking on the surface is good, then uh, what we can do is we scan uh, a a relatively large surface to find a good location. Like for example, you can like uh, here I scan a 50, uh, 50 nanometer area, right? I search for the 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 good spot for the final zoom in scan, right? And uh, for this, like uh, if you during this surface scan, if you see some contaminations, like for this, this is very small contaminations, right? And um, try to use the offset to uh, avoid those contamination immediately. Right. We don't want to like a letter the tip to scan over the contamination over and over. So if you see the contamination, use offset to offset a cleaner area. Right. And once we find a a clean surface, right, if you want to uh, see those steps and also the as well as the lattice, you can zoom in onto the edge. Right. If you want to only see the lattice, then you can zoom in to on those like a flat area. And the example here I show is I zoom onto the edge. Right, you can see this uh, lattice on both the top surface and the bottom surface, as well as a single atomic step here. And this we call like a two atomic motion. Right, if there's any like a defect in the lattice, we will be able to see the defects also. So for the multimode in the fluid, the maximum psi, uh, scan uh, speed is like um, uh, frequency is uh, two kilohertz, right? And for with the regular setting, so if you have the uh, the high high rate, you have uh, eight kilohertz. So if we offer at the two kilohertz, right? Then if we scan at the two fifty six by two fifty six, then the maximum speed we can go is uh, roughly like a uh, four hertz, right? That's typically uh, good enough, right? You can see this this is scanned at the four hertz, and if I warm up the system enough, even with the four hertz, you don't see you can see a little bit drift still, but not that much, right? If you want, you can afford the stable system, and you will get a very nice image. And if you scan at 512 by 512, then the maximum scan speed is 2 hertz, right? And also, uh, I want to mention again is uh, for this like imaging, you need to be patient. 
right? You need to spend a lot of time to prepare, clean, warm up the system, right? And also, uh, once it engaged, it will still may uh, require some time to let the uh, system to stabilize. And once stabilized, you will get a nice uh, terminal reach menu. So here I summarize uh, the procedure for the this uh, imaging technique, right? So we first uh, set up, uh, I typically recommend a set up the tip sample distance in the air and the roughly the laser alignment position, right? Then we can put the system in the uh, enclosure to let it warm up. Then we start to clean the sample, clean the fluid cell, right? Meanwhile, let the system to warm up. Then we can further clean the, the sample with some pure water, right? Add a small drop, right? To clean it a few times. And uh, the last drop uh, do not uh, like overspill on the on the sample part. Then we can mount the the a new fresh probe in the full cell, right? And add one drop of the pure water also, right? On the on the on the cantilever to wet the probe. Then we can mount the sample, right? Install the full cell, then align the laser and the PSTD. So if you already warm up the system um, before this step, then you need to do this step as fast as possible. We want to minimize any operation outside enclosure. Otherwise, it will introduce uh, more shift once it's uh, uh, set up. And it will take a longer time to uh, stabilize. So if you have, uh, if you want, you can wait like 30 minutes to let a further stabilize the system, right? And one thing here is once we added the fluid and the let the water warm up, and the water, the fluid may be like heat up a little bit by the uh, the air fan, right? A few degree high probably, right? And that a few degree increase in the temperature will cause the cantilever to uh, bend a little bit, right? And it, typically, what I do is I will uh, before I engage, I will check the defection um, on the on the air fan, right? If it's uh, off a little bit, then I need to adjust again right before the engage. So uh, then uh, it's warm up, then we can uh, set up the engage scanning parameter and uh, start to engage, right? And once we confirm the tracking is good, we optimize uh, the parameter, right? And uh, we can uh, offset uh, the XY to the clean area uh, to uh, to the final uh, scan. Okay. And uh, here I have some uh, questions also uh, to review here. So the first question is uh, how to control the contamination. And this is the most critical step uh, for the atomic resolution imaging in the fluid, right? And there's a few things, right? When to clean the uh, the tweezer, clean the sample, clean the fluid cell, right? We want to use the pure water, the anechoic grade pure water for the image media, right? We make sure don't spill the water into the sample part, otherwise it will cause contaminations. And we need to wear gloves uh, to um, handle the parts. And when you mount the cantilever or handle the fluid cell, I try not to breathe on the uh, country of all the fluid cell. It may cause uh, additional contaminations. And the next question is uh, how to control the drift in the atomic resolution imaging with pupils tapping, right? And uh, for this case, it's uh, slightly different from the contact mode. Contact mode, we can use scan fast. In the pupils tapping, we can scan not that fast, right? And the key thing to uh, control the drift is we need to warm up the, warm up the system, right? Once you install the probe before you engage, wait a little bit, like 30 minutes, to let it stabilize. Right? If you can wait a little longer, that's even better, right? And the other thing is uh, we use like the the maximum uh, speed, right? If we scan two kilohertz, two fifty six uh, by two fifty six, and we scan at a four uh, four hertz of the scan rate. Right? And next question is how to keep the tip sharp, right? There's a few things also, right? When you want to uh, use a lower engage set point, lower uh, scanning uh, uh, set point also, right? And also the contamination control is the key to control the uh, tip shop, right? We want to control the contamination on the surface. Otherwise, the tip will get contaminated. It won't be sharp. And the last question is what type of probe is preferred? Right? We talk about a little bit more detail on this one already. We want to use like uh, the smaller cantilever, which has a better defense sensitivity, right? And we want to use soft cantilever. And typically, the thinner cantilever, the thinner, thinner legs of the cantilever is better because it has a less hydrodynamic dampening, right? And we mentioned a few a choice of the probe, like SNLC, right? Scanning series of three the plus, and also fast scan C probe. 
Okay. Uh, it's a, little, a few minutes over the time, but that's all for today's session. So next, uh, I'll take a look if there's any questions from the audience. Let me open up the questions. Q&A. So first question I have here, I read that after cleave the surface, let it overnight can help to dissipate the static charge. Is that right? Yeah, I agree. So the, the static charge can dissipate over time in the air. So you can leave it overnight if you have a closed environment, right? And putting it on the airframe closed air, that helps. Yeah, definitely. So, but if you can use those anesthetic gun, it will uh, dissipate the charge uh, very quickly. So one thing I will concern is if you leave overnight, right? If the inside of the enclosure is not uh, very clean, then it may have uh, uh, introduced contaminations on the sample. So as long as that's a problem, not a problem, then uh, leave it overnight definitely will help to dissipate the static charge. So next question, uh, what is it possible for us to have the slides, please? Um, yes, uh, so I recorded this uh, presentation, and uh, after this done, I will convert it to the video, and I will uh, upload it to our training website. So if you don't know, um, you probably have the um, uh, once you like uh, finish this uh, plan, uh, the webinar, then uh, it will pop up. Actually, go to the default uh, training web page, and over there, uh, there's uh, like a link, like uh, for those uh, recordings. And there's a lot of uh, videos we have there over, right, from the previous presentation. And for the same thing for this one, once I convert it, I will upload it there, so you can have, uh, uh, if you want, you can review these uh, presentations again. Seems like that's all the questions I have. Um, let me see if I have it from the chat. Um, one question from the chat is like, uh, what mean? What does it mean like X Y closed loop? Yeah, I, I guess probably you have a multi mode. It doesn't have closed loop. So for the fast scan icon and uh, Innova, they all have the closed loop. What it does is uh, it uses the X Y sensor. Typically, like for the icon fast scan, it's like a String, string gauge sensor to measure the actual movement of the scanner and try to move, make the movement linear. So the XY sensor uh, is pretty good, but it's, um, uh, I would say, not quite there for the atomic resolution imaging. So um, for the atomic resolution imaging, uh, make sure you turn off the XY closed loop. We operate in open loop. Yeah, so next question is, so. Could you please uh, repeat why do we need to open uh, uh, open loop on the icon? I mentioned uh, in the closed loop, there will be little, uh, the noise in the X Y will be too high, and we are uh, look at the atomic scale features. So the closed loop is not as good uh, for the atomic resolution. So we need to open uh, use the open loop on icon. I think that's all the questions. And I just want to mention again, so uh, this uh, autonomous imaging is very hands-on, right? And uh, it requires a lot of practice. So I covered some major uh, uh, key points for the autonomous resolution. And then uh, hopefully like, later on, if you uh, want to practice, it will be helped. I couldn't like uh, go to a lot of details, but uh, if you're really interested in this uh, autonomous resolution imaging, and we're going to have a uh, factory cl uh, training class in April, and we will talk more details and have a lot of hands-on practice in the class in April. And it is called the full imaging, so, yeah, and image quality. So if you're interested, uh, you're welcome to uh, sign up for that factory class. And it's on the, the registration is on the same, same web page where you can find those, uh, uh links for the, for the webinar, uh, recording. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and, uh, see you guys next time.